Now we'll begin thinking about what happens when that second assumption in Hardy-Weinberg is violated. In other words, let's think about the situation when there is mutation. So mutations will be modeling in one direction, so from a capital A allele to the lowercase allele, and they'll happen with probability mu, this Greek letter. That's the per generation, per allele mutation rate. And so now if we think about what's the new frequency of P, it's the old frequency of P minus the proportion of those alleles that mutated. So we could also represent it this way. What's the new value of Q? Well, it's the old value of Q plus the ones that mutated to it. And the reason we're thinking about mutation in uh, one direction is first because it's simpler, and second because, um, as we're about to see, most of the time when we're thinking about mutation, we're thinking about mutations from functional alleles, advantageous ones, into non-functioning deleterious ones. And the number of mutations that could kind of ruin a good allele is much, much larger than the number of mutations that could fix a broken one, right? There's only one mutation that can cause this to be functional again, right? Reversing the first mutation, whereas there are a number of different ones that could cause a deleterious allele. So because when we think about these as being advantageous and these being deleterious, there are much more mutations that go to the right, we typically neglect the reverse mutation process. So the derivations we're about to do are typically when we're thinking about going from advantageous to deleterious mutations. And the mutations are going to take advantageous alleles and change them into deleterious ones, but then selection is going to be selecting against those and favoring them. So usually what we're interested in thinking about when we think about mutation is mutation selection balance. So if we think about our range of values of P from zero to one, P is at some sort of um, value, um, probably fairly common because it's um, the advantageous allele, so say the value of P is here. Well, these mutations will be reducing the value of P, but selection will be increasing the value of P, right, because that capital A allele is advantageous. So we're thinking about kind of a tension back and forth with mutations bringing this value down, selection moving this value up, some sort of equilibrium there. So we're thinking about some sort of situation in which the value of P is being reduced by mutation but increased by selection. Similarly, the value of Q is being increased by mutation and reduced by selection. And then there's some sort of equilibrium that will be achieved here. And that's one of the other reasons we looked at equilibrium when we talked about selection in the previous example. So we'll be looking at a general case. We're going to be interested in fitnesses of the following type. The wild type fitness will be one, right, the capital A homozygote. The heterozygote here will have a reduced fitness, and then this homozygote will have a fully reduced fitness. This value H represents how dominant or recessive deleterious allele is. So if you think about it, if H is equal to zero, if H is equal to zero, then this fitness becomes just one, and that means that this lowercase a allele is recessive, right? Because having one copy does not change the fitness, you have to have two copies to change the fitness. On the other hand, if this value of H is equal to one, then that fitness becomes one minus S. So having one copy is just as bad as having two copies. So the lowercase allele would be dominant. So even though it is deleterious, it can also be dominant if this H value is one. And then values of H between zero and one let us know how relatively recessive or relatively dominant that allele is. Okay, so this is the formulation. We're doing this for a general case. We're thinking about these three fitnesses, and now we want to think about how the frequency of the capital A allele is changed. 
So when we think about frequencies being changed, we want to think about our new value of p. What's the new value of p? It was 1 minus mu times the old value of p. And then this represents the change due to mutation, but we also know that selection is changing this. And we have our equation from earlier in the course, how selection modifies the value of p. The new frequency of p after selection was given by this. So we want to figure out kind of when is this going to be the same as p or when is that not going to change. We're going to use this um, and let's simplify this a little bit. One thing to note is that we have w bar down there so we're going to rem remind ourselves of what this is. This was p squared w11 plus 2pq w12 plus q squared w22. For our fitnesses that we had from before, remember our fitnesses were 1, 1 minus h, s, 1 minus s, p squared times 1 plus 2pq, 1 minus h, s, plus q squared, 1 minus s, p squared, plus 2pq minus 2pq, h, s, plus q squared minus s q squared. And we can simplify here because we can see that this and this and this all add up to 1. 1 minus 2 p q h s minus s q squared. And now I'm actually going to do another simplification here, another step. We're thinking about the mean fitness here. And the mean fitness is going to be a little bit less than 1, right, because there are deleterious mutations that are segregating in the population. And it's going to be reduced by these two terms here. Um, this term here, if we think about it, these deleterious alleles are rare, right, because they're being selected against. That means that Q is likely to be a very small number, and P is likely to be close to 1. If you take a really, really small number and square it, it gets even smaller. So this last term here is going to be much smaller than this term here. So for simplicity and to kind of make an approximation we can work with, we're going to assume that this thing is about zero, approximately zero. So we're going to neglect that term. So this will be our um, w bar. That's what we'll substitute up into here. And again, this was all equal to p prime. So the thing we're interested in here, right? if this is p prime, we want to solve for equilibrium conditions. And so at equilibrium, that would be delta p is equal to 0. Another way of thinking about that is that p prime would be equal to p. So one way to figure out what that mutation selection balance would be is when this equation here ends up being equal to p. So we should set those equal to each other and solve for those conditions and see what we get. So the p prime that we had was this 1 minus mu p squared w11 plus pq w12 all over this. And we're interested in setting that equal to p like so. So the first thing that we can notice is that we have a p on this side. And this numerator here has a, a p term there and a p term there. So we could like take those out of the brackets. And then we'd be able to cancel on both sides. So we can actually cancel right off the bat like that. So what do we get? We get on this side 1 equals 1 minus mu p w11 plus q w12 all over 1 minus 2 p q h s. And then we can substitute in here. We know that w11 is equal to 1. w12 
is equal to 1 minus hs. So we can substitute those um, in there and in there. So 1 equals 1 minus mu. P times 1 plus Q times 1 minus HS all over 1 minus 2 P Q H S. So if it's starting to look kind of big and ugly, remember we often get simplifications when we're doing our population genetics. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to multiply both sides by this denominator here to get it up onto the other side. So that would give us this term multiplied by 1, so that's really just 1 minus 2 p q h s is now equal to 1 minus mu. p times 1 is just um, p plus q and then minus q h s and then p plus q, that's equal to 1. So 1 minus 2 p q h s equals 1 minus mu 1 minus q h s. So now I have these. Let's multiply this side out. One minus q h s negative mu positive mu q h s. There's a, a leading one on each of those sides, so we can cancel those out. And I'm going to make another one of these approximations here. In this term here, if q is really small, then p is approximately 1. So I'm going to say that p is approximately 1. And now if I look at the right-hand side here, okay, q is small, mu is small, but in this term, they're actually both being multiplied by each other, which means this term is going to be much, much smaller than either of those. So we're going to neglect that term as well. So we know now that we're getting an approximate solution. We're not going to get like an exact solution. We're getting something fairly approximate. But it should hold as long as q is small and as long as the mutation rate is small, both of which are generally true. So what do we get on the left-hand side? Um, we get negative 2QHS equals negative QHS minus mu. These terms can be combined. When you add this to both sides, you'll actually knock out one of those two, so you'll have a negative QHS equals negative mu. Nobody likes negative signs, so we can multiply both sides by negative 1. And then moving this over, we now have QHS equals mu. Now remember what we're doing all this for is to solve for an equilibrium frequency of one of the alleles. And so we have Q right there, so really we want to solve for Q. So Q equals mu over um, SH. And that'll actually be an equilibrium frequency, right? Because we started this whole thing off by assuming that there would be no change in P, and that's the same thing as no change in Q. And so this thing here, this is our approximate solution. For the equilibrium frequency of a deleterious allele in a population under mutation selection balance where mutations keep making more deleterious alleles and selection keeps removing those alleles, how many of those alleles do you end up with or what is the equilibrium frequency of those alleles in that population? It's given by this equation here, which we can then use to answer some interesting questions.